Let's stand to our feet this morning. Come, let us worship. Here we go, church. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what I say? Then see what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, yeah.
11. It's going to be in the back here where the kids' crew normally meets. Uh, we'll be done before noon and be out of here by noon. Uh, this is going to be an opportunity for us to take a look at where we've been this past year, uh, where we are now as a church, and where we're going to be heading into the next uh, into the next year. A lot of interesting stuff going on. We want to make sure that um, everybody has an opportunity to hear what's going on and to uh, even share your thoughts. So we invite you to be there at 11 o'clock if you consider Shipyard your home. Just another couple brief announcements. Um, our giving tree has been a great success. Um, I'm really excited to see all the gifts that we're going to be giving to the South Shore Foster Closet. Um, if you took a tag to take a gift and did not bring your gift in yet, that is by today, um, please contact us during the week. You can send an email to info at shipyardchurch.org. We'll figure out a way to get it. I think it looks like just about all the gifts have been brought in, but just in case somebody didn't get it in, I want to remind you of that. Um, and lastly, I want to let you know or want to remind you that on Christmas Eve, we're going to have a special service. That's Saturday, December 24th, Christmas Eve. We're going to be meeting here just like it's Sunday, except it's going to be at 1030, not 10 o'clock. So we're going to give you a little extra time to sleep in or do stuff with the kids. Um, Sunday, December 25th, we're not going to be having a service. So no service on Sunday the 25th. We'll have our Christmas service on Saturday, 24th, here at 1030. And we look forward to seeing you all then. Thank you. Hey, good morning. Welcome. Glad you could be here this morning at Shipyard. Uh, make yourselves comfortable. Have a seat. Uh, thank you for tuning in online. Thank you for uh, filling up the house here this morning at Pins and Kingston. Glad that we can continue to celebrate uh, Advent. Glad that we can be here just to, to be refreshed in the Lord and reconnected in who he is and what this season is about. Glad to see you all. Um, our hope is that you'll just be encouraged uh, today from God's Word, from the preaching of the Word, and I hope you'll be encouraged uh, by our time afterwards as well. I want to just invite you to, to hang out and uh, to connect after the service, uh, just to learn more about the church and to reflect on what God's been up to and, and just to be a part of that process. So I'll share a bit of uh, you know, the, the vision, kind of recap on the vision, to discuss a bit of where we've been, right, where we are, where we're going, as Tron mentioned be a part of that. I'm not going to drone on and on. I'll share a bit, and there'll be others that share, uh, but we want to give opportunity for reflection, a time for uh, dialogue and interaction, for you guys to carry any thoughts or uh, su suggest or ask questions, things like that. So it'll be uh, interactive in nature, and we'll cut you loose in time uh, to get you into the rest of your day. Um, I want to pray, and then I want to uh, look into God's Word. Um, I want to just warn here at the beginning that Christmas is an incredible time, but it's also a challenging time. Uh, it brings in a lot of past hurts and current hurts and uh, past memories, some good, some tough. Uh, Christmas also brings us to a very familiar story for some of us, and it's easy just to say, yeah, I've heard this, I, I know this. In fact, the passage we'll look at today for a good part of our time is actually probably one of the most uh, known verses in all of Scripture. Whether you're a believer or not, I would venture out to say that you've probably heard this verse. And there's a real danger in just sort of tuning it out. I know that. I've heard that. I believe that. Uh, but let's go beyond that. My prayer today is that Christmas will uh, hit our hearts in a new way, in a fresh way today. And that this verse, John three sixteen and 17, will have deeper significance, that it might reignite something within us, that we might know this God that loves us in a better way now, and that we might take that love, this incredible, unwavering love of God, and that we would press into those around us with that love. But may Christmas hit us in a new way now, and may a familiar passage stir us up and challenge us, shake us up, and maybe, if it's new, lead you to a place of understanding that you didn't have before and lead you to a place of faith, maybe for the first time as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and we acknowledge your goodness. We acknowledge your love. We acknowledge our need for you. Uh, Father, we ask that we would make much of you now as we open your word, that our hearts and minds would be woven together and woven together with you. that you would further prepare us to receive you in a new way, that this Christmas season would have great impact and significance. 
God, teach us and guide us and use us as you see fit here in the community that you would build up this congregation, that you would energize Shipyard Church, that we would continue to be your hands and feet in unique ways. So God, have your way in us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Christmas Vacation, kind of a classic Christmas movie. Some love it, some hate it, but there's kind of this storyline that ripples through it. And Clark Griswold, kind of the main hero uh, of the movie, uh, is going through kind of a wild season. It's Christmas, it's Advent, and all of his family continue to sort of uh, barrel into his house, come into his house. He's got in-laws there, and he's got his wild cousin Eddie show up and say, hey, listen, we're not going to leave for another month, so get used to us. And they just sort of pile in there, and it's just pandemonium and chaos. And as the days evaporate and, and, and Clark is drawing near to Christmas, he is growing in agitation. And it's not because of a full house. I mean, that has something to do with it. Uh, but what's going on is that Clark had uh, made an arrangement to have an in-ground pool installed at their house. And in some ways, he uh, wrote a check that he couldn't cash. He didn't have the funding to pay for the new in-ground pool. And so he had uh, made some arrangements, given a deposit, had done some things with credit to sort of establish this pathway of getting an in-ground pool for the family. Uh, but the problem was he had this sort of fiscal gap. He couldn't pay for the pool. And so he's growing in angst and irritation as the days evaporate. It's Christmas Eve now, and there's a knock at the door, and everyone, he's on pins and needles. They run to the door to see maybe this is the bonus he's been waiting for. Historically, he would get this big bonus. Everybody at the company would get a big bonus, and they would really fund Christmas and other things with the bonus. And so he's like, okay, this must be it. And so this delivery guy comes to the door, bang, 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 envelope in hand. And Clark's like, yeah. Oh, thank you. I'm good. We're covered. The delivery driver just informs him, hey, I'm sorry, Mr. Griswold. You know, I lost the envelope between the seats in the car, and here you go. And so Clark gets the envelope. He opens the envelope, and the family's gathered around, and he begins to give this, like, heartfelt speech. Oh, man. This is, guys, you know, I wanted to tell you that I have all... And he opens the envelope, and he reads the envelope, and it says... Wait a minute, I'm, I've been entered into an annual membership of the Jelly of the Month Club. And then Cousin Eddie in the back is like, hey, it's a gift that keeps on giving all year round. That it is, Eddie, that it is. And there's just this rage that comes out of Clark now. So there's this business owner, Frank, who kind of withheld some good things for those around him. And he, sort of fell prey to greed rather than giving the bonuses. Everybody's the Jelly of the Month Club. And it was just a reminder for me as I was thinking about that movie and the humor of that movie that we can so often fall into a world that just puts me, us, at the center. That we can so easily get caught up in our own greed and what's most important to us. And we can so easily kind of just hoard all the blessings and goodness of God that we have received from him, whether it's resources or most significantly the spiritual resources that we have from him, namely his love and his mercy and his word, we can so easily just become sort of inward, insular, disconnected. But God establishes just a better pathway. Christmas is this incredible picture of the generosity of God's love, the generosity of his grace, the radical generosity of his rescue of us. God doesn't withhold anything. He has given us all of these incredible gifts, all of these great blessings. He has given us life everlasting through Jesus. He hasn't held anything back from us to give us life. It's easy to get sort of caught up in our rhythms and our pathways and our agendas and our goals and our future plans. It's so easy to get lost there. But as we receive the love of Christ and the ways of Christ, may we take his good things and may we lavish them upon those around us. Giving them a picture of that first Christmas. Giving them a picture of this incredible King and Savior that has done so much for us.
that we take all that we are, all that we have from the Lord, and may we hold it loosely to bless those around us. Frank was hoarding, greedy, self-absorbed. I've been there. We've been there. But God breaks in, shining his light and establishing something better, something different that buoys a soul, that lifts our hearts and minds and brings us out of our propensity and sort of this bent to having something that hinges on us completely, shattering kind of this mindset that we are at the epicenter of it all, leading us deeper into him and who he is so that we would be a, established in the pathways of Jesus. John 3.16 opens like this, for God so loved the world. Friends, if you're wrestling over the notion or idea of God being loving, let this statement just ring true in your hearts and minds. For God so loved. I hear all kinds of different things in our day and philosophies and theologies that say God is not loving. He is angry, iron-fisted. He's detached from the world. He's detached from me. He is this and maybe this incredible being, but he's to be feared in a negative way. He's to be avoided. Like, if there is a God, he's not anyone I want to be consumed by or connected with in any way. But as we encounter truth from the pages of the Word of God, we are confronted by the fact that God is loving. For God so loved the world. The God who is love didn't talk about love alone. The love of God is extended, it's revealed, it's shown, it's a choice backed by action. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. For God so loved. But the object of the love is the world. Well, what's the world? Uh, the world in this context is a, a group of people, a bunch of people disconnected from God those that actually would stand in opposition to God and the things of God sort of bound in, in sin and rebellion. For God so loved the world. This is a group of people that were not deserving of, of the grace of God, the mercy of God. In fact, this is a group of people that includes us that robbed God of the good things he intended, that robbed God of this flawless relationship that we were designed for. He loved. He extended this kindness. Though we were undeserving, though we brought nothing to the table, he reaches out in love as the remedy. The object of his love is us, the people that are estranged from him. For God so loved the world. The object of that love is the world. Those that may be disconnected on the fringes, not now right with God, but God comes in mercy in his love to rescue the world, to rescue us, though detached from this God, though deserving of his rejection and destruction. He comes to make a way. For God so loved the world. Be confident this morning knowing that God is a loving God, faithful, good God, a God that has compassion and empathy for you, concern for you. Don't listen to sort of the, the thoughts of the world that says, no, God is not true or God is not love. No, God is loving and he's come for you. And look at this, he gave, God gave his only son for us that he gave. He gave. He didn't withhold. He gave everything. He gave the treasure of the universe, the, the prize of the universe, the meaning of the universe, the one that everything hinges in, our hope. He, he gave the Son. So God incarnate, God in the flesh, as a second member of the Trinity, the Son of God comes. The Father sends the Son, giving us this incredible Christmas gift, the greatest gift ever. We've been joking in our house recently because last year we, we, got, we, we adopted our doggy, Teddy, and we're like, she's the best Christmas gift that we've ever had, except Jesus. Like, Jesus is on a whole other level. Teddy's pretty cool. We're thankful for her. She's brought all this joy and excitement and, you know, scratches and, and chewing and ripping and stuff to the house. Like, we love her, but man, Jesus is the greatest gift. How cliche, I know, but it's true. God gave the Son. He loved us, delighted in us, 
so much that he made a way for us to be right with him, to be in relationship with him, to be communing with him, to be a part of this fellowship that will never end. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life or eternal life. Have we received this blessing and this gift? Have we heard the message of Jesus? Have we heard about what God's done to rescue us, to make us right with him? Have we heard that and have we believed in this? Have we received Jesus in faith? Have we accepted this great gift to us from God? If you have, the ones who believe in him should not perish. That means there's no eternal demise or destruction or eternal disconnect from God, but have eternal life through Christ with God as empowered by the Holy Spirit. God's extended his love to the world, to those that have been disconnected from him. Jesus is the means of our hope and salvation. He's the vehicle for our rescue. He's the one that brings us to the Father, the one we're designed to worship, the one we've been designed by and for to be in fellowship with. And the result of this is this unwavering, joy-filled life. Have you believed? Have you trusted? Have you received him? The angels and demons believe in Jesus. The angels and demons know tons about the Father and about the working of the kingdom. This type of belief is a full surrender and yielding to this great God. It's entrust our lives fully into his hands now and into the future. And it's to hear from him. It's to trust in him. It's to obey him. There's this transformation that takes place where he's king and he's Lord and we listen for him and we pursue him and we trust him. Have we believed? Have we entrusted our lives? Have we yielded our lives and entrusted our lives and our futures completely to him, finding this life? Verse 17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. It wasn't to condemn but so that the world might find salvation through Christ. He's our pathway. He's our hope. He's our future. He is our means of salvation. It's the work of God on our behalf through Jesus, but Jesus is the vehicle by which we might be saved and brought into new life, made new. And it's all the work of God on our behalf, and it's all his love extended to us. This is an incredible picture of a God who wasn't stingy, who didn't withhold good things from us, but though we didn't deserve it, he's come mercifully pursuing us, giving us rescue and hope and transformation internally and externally, bringing us into the kingdom of God. It's interesting, there is a I think a danger in in wanting to have sort of authority or, again, right, the significance we're we're positioned in the heart of everything, that everything revolves around us. We struggle with it, though we're becoming new creations, know that we have this new new identity in the Lord. We struggle with those type of tendencies, right? But we weren't the only ones. There's an interesting interaction with Jesus and some of his followers in Matthew chapter 20. And there in Matthew chapter 20, we, we see... Uh, James and John's mama come into the mix. And, and, and the sons of Zebedee, James and John, their, their mom comes and sits at the feet of Jesus, kneels at Jesus' feet and says, basically, listen, you're, you're establishing this new kingdom, but can you promise us, can you promise us that in the new kingdom, they will sit at your right hand and your left hand, that one of my boys will be at your right and the other will be at your left? Can you promise them that they'll have significance and authority in that future kingdom. Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink this cup of wrath? Can you drink this cup? And he's talking about the suffering and the judgment that he was going to receive for us. Can you drink this cup? I don't think you know what you're talking about. And like, oh yeah, we can drink that cup. Yeah, you're right, you will. James and John are going to suffer some heartache. and We find out after. Yeah, you can drink this cup. But what you're asking isn't something I determine. It's something the Father will determine who sits at my right and who sits at my left. 
And these other disciples become really agitated. The other followers, right, the other ten are like really indignant and upset about this conversation as they're sort of jockeying for power. And uh, partly maybe they're upset because they didn't ask the question because they wanted significance, that they wanted to be at the center of all, that they wanted to sort of have this power. Maybe they were just indignant because they're like, how rude, how disrespectful. You've missed the big picture about the kingdom. You missed the picture of this upside-down kingdom that is not like the kingdoms of man. Jesus then breaks in, and he, he says this after. This is Matthew chapter 20, verse 25. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. You know that the rulers and leaders of our day, they take authority and they suppress and they, they crush and they take advantage of this position and these positions they have. They're sort of power hungry. They get a taste of significance and the ability to shape things and make decisions. And they just smother people and they control people. Verse 26, it shall not be so among you. My followers, those who have trusted me as Lord and King that know that I'm the way and the truth and the life, those children of God, those that are now in the kingdom of heaven that have come into this new reality that have been rescued, this is not how we operate. This is not, from Jesus' perspective, what you're to be like. We are different. We are unique. We're new creations. We, we live according to another kingdom, and we live according to another set of standards. We walk in these other rhythms and other ways. It shall not be so among you. Verse 26 there. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. For those that are going to have significance, to have a kingdom impact, they're going to be your due loss your servant, your bondservant, your slave. Uh, they're going to serve you. They're going to leverage your gifts and all that they have for your good and my glory. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. It's an upside-down kingdom, guys. It's not like the kingdoms of our day. It's so radical and so unique and so different and so life-giving the Son was empowered as a second member of the Trinity of God in the flesh, the Son of God, our Rescuer. He had all of this, has this great authority and power and strength, and yet the power and authority that he has, and he had in those days, he leveraged for the good of others, for the beauty and the goodness and the furtherance of others, for the flourishing of culture and sound thinking. Whoever be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. This is heavy language. That means that for me as a pastor, it's not me just standing up front delivering messages. That's part of what God's called me to and how I've been gifted in some ways. But I should be leading a charge and, and having a tender heart and caring for the, your needs and uh, setting a charge collectively, setting an example and a tone for how we can love well in the community sharing this love. My position and perspective and situations to stand up and uh, talk and preach alone, that's just a small fraction of what I'm called to do. To serve and to lead in any capacity, no matter your situation or your context, the Lord is calling us first to serve to see the needs of others around us, and if we're able, by the grace of God, see how we can address those needs and how we can encourage the dreams and the goals and the agendas of those around us become priority to us, to see others flourish as they follow the Master. Whoever would be first among you must be your slave, there is a commitment of sacrifice and love to those around us. The great commandment, we're to love God and to love our neighbor as we would love ourselves. Verse 28, 
this is incredible. Jesus has posed and proposed something, and he's reinforcing and enforcing a new rhythm and a new pattern that was foreign. But he hasn't asked them to do something that he himself is not willing to do. He wasn't saying, hey, this is great for you all. He's saying, look to me. Because what I've proposed has come from my infinite wisdom in my heart and my being. And what I've proposed for you, I do and embody, and I will show you the way. Whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man. And he is addressing himself, the Son of Man, one of Jesus' favorite titles for himself, because he's the quintessential man. He's everything we were supposed to be and more. The Son of Man. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The Son of Man came not to be served. He said, I didn't come for the red carpets and the pomp and circumstance. I didn't come to have entourages for my entourages. I didn't come for all of that. I came to serve. The King of all kings washes the feet of his followers extending this kindness and this mercy and this love so otherworldly, so unfathomable. It's a tough word to say. The Savior came to serve. And how would he do this? He gives. He gives. He gave. The Father gave. The Son gives. And to give his life as a ransom for many. We were bound in darkness. We were destined for destruction. We we were caught up in all kinds of stuff. Death was a reality, a future reality, a long-suffering, unending death and disconnect from God. We were bound into this kingdom of darkness. We were under the guise of another false kingdom, the enemy, Satan. We were held there, kidnapped, if you will. Jesus willingly gives his life to pay our ransom so that we might be set free, led into a new reality, into a new kingdom, a reality not where we're separate and we're like rogue free agents away from God now, just sort of in a better standing. No, we've been set free from all of this difficulty, all the sin, all of this brokenness, all of this evil, all of this stuff, so that we could be set free from that that the shackles of all of that would be broken, but so that we'd be set free to a life now lived in God. Freedom is found in a life tethered to the living God who loves us and who didn't withhold anything but gave his son for us. Jesus said, I came not to be served, but to serve and to lay down my life for you all so that you could be set free Christmas is all about the radical rescue that the Father would provide through the Son. It's all about the radical generosity of this awesome God towards us. He's inviting us to follow his footsteps. I want to just thank you and commend you for everything that you've done, the way you've served the Lord, the things that you've done to establish and bring Shipyard into reality gathering week in and week out, setting up chairs and setting up tech and leading the band and providing hospitality and following up and taking care of building into the kids and discipling the next generation. All of these things, these are offerings of love and gratitude back to the Lord so that he might be magnified, that we might be built up in the faith and so that we would go out from here to love well, to live these radical lives of generosity. Because the thing is, Jesus is calling us not only to believe and to trust and to surrender, but then to pick up the cadence that he's established for us. To mimic his movements to the world around us. He came not to be served, but to serve. He's inviting us to continue in that bent, to continue to serve, to continue to leverage all that we have for his glory. He's inviting us to continue to be his mouthpiece, sharing the good news of Jesus, telling others about this loving God. He's inviting us to press on and live in this 
life of generosity, living in the life that we have now, this grace-filled life, this transformative life, this eternal life, basking in that, but living out of that, that we'd be his conduits of all the good things that he has for us and for those around us. Continue to give. Continue to love. And I'm not just talking about fiscally. It's part of it, but I'm talking about laying down your life, putting the needs of others before your own, using your gifts for your neighbor, using your gifts to encourage a brother or sister in the body. And we continue to embrace this life of following Jesus, this life of making him known. I was reading in a, 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 in a book recently, and in that book, the author used this illustration about Oprah. There was this conversation about Oprah talking about her career and um, her struggles with her acting career years ago. She's like, I'm just struggling as an actress, and I, you know, I need some coaching and guidance. And her mentor just stopped her and said, you know, um, your issue uh, in acting isn't really an acting issue. Your issue is that you don't want to be an actress. You want to be a star. And that resonated and kind of clicked with her, and it kind of led her on a new trajectory. I think sometimes we have the propensity to want to be a star, but ultimately we're to reflect the beauty of our great star, our master, our savior. He's inviting us to a a journey with him, and he's inviting us to embrace what he embraced. And that's a life of being focused on the Father, It's a life of radical selflessness. It's a life of gracious generosity. He's inviting us to follow him as servants, just as he is our great servant. There's this old adage, an old pastoral preacher adage, Jesus, others, you. Acronym, joy. May that be something we grapple with, focusing on Jesus, who he is, what he's leading us into. We focus on others and certainly caring for ourselves as well so that we can run the race that he set out before us. Paul gave this great blessing to the people in Thessalonians. He said, you're loving well, but keep it up. Friends, you're loving well. Keep it up. Let's go further together. Let's continue to lean into Jesus and his great generosity. Let's continue to share the gospel with others I'll conclude with this as we sing one last time and transition into our next phase this morning. Who might you encourage this week tangibly? Who might you be able to bless this week? Maybe there's a neighbor that's struggling. Maybe it's a coworker that's struggling. Who can you encourage? You may not be positioned in some ways at times. You're like, I'm kind of shut in. How can you be praying intentionally for those around us? But what can we do to bless someone this week and may that sort of life of Jesus living and radical living and this grand love extended to others uh, spark now in new ways, but may it carry us into this new year. Jesus gave. He gave everything. He gave his life. And now we're invited to give of who we are in him. So let's continue to give his love and his grace. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity this morning just to look into your word for a few moments. Thank you for not holding anything back. Thank you for giving us this new life. Lord, I pray for just anyone tuning in right now that may not yet know you, that maybe right now um, faith will be placed in you, Jesus. So we just acknowledge now, we take this stride of faith for the first time this morning. We just say, Jesus, we know that you are good. We know that you are Savior and and King. And Jesus, I'm understanding more and more, you came specifically for me to give life, and I trust you, I believe in you. I yield my life to you now and going forward. Rescue me, forgive me for my sins, give me new life, and carry me forward in your ways. God, build us up in the faith, Lord. Help us to lean into you. Help us to be reminded about how great your love is. And may that great love carry us into the future as your hands and feet, extending your goodness to all we can. Father, bless Shipyard. Encourage everyone here. Guide them, everyone here, into this week with purpose and hope and a sense of your love for them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Church, you guys have a blessed week. You guys are dismissed.